Good morning, everyone. Just to let you know that we are running a bit behind. We're waiting for some more of our in-person attendees to arrive. So hopefully we will start in five minutes. Thanks. All right, good morning and welcome to today's workshop, an introduction to 3D food printing. My name is Michelle Sigvoldson and I am the director of the Food Science and Development section here at Alberta's Food Processing Development Center. As I look around the room, I see new faces and I see some faces that I know. So welcome and we do appreciate you being here with us today for those that have come for in person. We haven't had snow for weeks and then yesterday we get a dump of snow and we're right back to winter road conditions. So we do have a few empty chairs this morning and people may be coming in a little bit as we're getting going. So pardon us if there's any noise that is associated with that. We also are happy to have an online audience joining us with virtual live stream of this, of this program. For our online audience, if you would like to ask a question, please click on the Q&A symbol at the top of your screen. Dolores, a member of our team and our IT support today, will ask the presenters your question at the end of their presentation with time permitting. This session and webinar is being recorded so that you can go back and review if there was anything that you wanted to catch up on or if you wanted to share it with a colleague or a friend. We'll be sending that link out to you via email. We may also have some folks joining us from media and they too might be taking some audio or film footage or pictures of today's events. We have some on-site uh, housekeeping and that is at the back of the room. We do have some coffee and tea, so please help yourself to, to that. Preferably at break time now, because any noise that we make in this room will be picked up for the audience that's going to be joined, that is joined us online. Across the hallway from where you came into this room, there are restrooms. And in the unlikely event of a fire alarm, we'll vacate the facility through an adjacent door next to this room outside. We'll meet at the muster point in the parking lot, and we ask that you all stay there until we can do roll call to make sure everyone's accounted for. So that's our housekeeping events. I would like to jump to our agenda. I can do that. And you may have picked up a copy on your way in, but I'd like to go through the agenda and provide some introductions to our guest speakers. Leading us this morning is Dr. John Filippo, who is going to speak to us on what is 3D food printing. Dr. John Filippo is currently a consultant and an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Agricultural, Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. He is the former Alberta Innovate Strategic Chair in Bio and Industrial Materials at the University of Alberta and a former executive director at Alberta Innovates Technology Futures, which was formerly Alberta Research Council. His areas of research include the development of sustainable materials from agricultural and forestry feedstocks, environmental life cycle assessment, sustainable foods, and the prevention of pipeline failures. Dr. Wolopko is a fellow of SM ASM, pardon me, the American Society of Materials International, and he is registered as a professional engineer in the province of Alberta. Next, we will have Dr. Rukhash Shamalevedi speak on the research of 3D printing, printability, and food safety. Dr. M. S. Rupesh is an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural, Food, and Nutritional Science at the University of Alberta, Canada. He received his PhD in Biological and Agricultural Engineering in 2012 from Washington State University and joined the University of Alberta in 2016. His research is focused on sustainable process engineering research to improve the safety, quality, and utilization of food and biomaterials. His research team is working towards developing advanced technologies, for example, atmospheric cold plasma, high intensity light pulses, and 3D printing, to improve water and food safety and the overall sustainability of food systems. 
Then Dr. Wendy Wismer will speak to us on consumer and business attitudes of 3D food printing. Dr. Wendy Wismer is an associate professor with the Department of Agricultural Food and Nutritional Science at the University of Alberta. She has an undergraduate degree in food science from the University of Alberta and earned her Master of Science in Consumer Studies and PhD in Food Science at the University of Guelph. Dr. Wismer's career path has taken her across Canada and to New Zealand and back, resulting in experience and expertise in the sensory science and consumer evaluation of a wide variety of food products, from beef and elk to kiwi fruit and apples. At the University of Alberta, her research program includes the assessment of sensory attributes and consumer acceptance of novel food technologies such as 3D printing and novel food ingredients, including pulses and insects. Following Dr. Wismer's presentation, we will take a short break to stretch our legs, and when we come back, Eliana, or Ellie, Weinstein will join us online with Breaking Free from the Mold, blending 3D printing with culinary arts. That's my cue. Ellie Weinstein is the founder and CEO of the company Coco Press, based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which is a manufacturer of 3D food printing machines and products. Ellie graduated in 2019 with a mechanical engineering degree from the prestigious University of Pennsylvania. She started working on Coco Press in high school, creating 3D chocolate printers in 2014, and has been working on growing the business full time for the last five years. Ellie has also appeared on BattleBots TV show as part of Team Mammoth, and is passionate about the ways she can use 3D printing across different industries. Following Ellie's presentation, we're going to divide up into groups and we're going to head into the laboratory and the culinary kitchen for two different 3D food printing demonstrations and an abbreviated tour of the Food Processing Development Center. Groups will spend about 15 or 20 minutes at, within each activity and it's at this point we're going to be saying goodbye to our online audience. Our 3D printing demonstration team is made up of three master students from the University of Alberta, and I see they've just popped out, um, but would include Daniela Gavita, Pauline Chang, and Laura Lopez Aladdin, and one of the food scientists from the Food Processing Development Center, Craig Hansen. Daniela, Pauline, and Laura will be demonstrating 3D food printing using two 3D printers brought to us from the University of Alberta. The FPDC, or the Food Processing Development Center, has only recently acquired a 3D food printer, which you will also see in the lab. However, we're not going to be uh, operating it for demonstration purposes today. Leading you to, on today's Tours of the Food Processing Development Center will have two of our food scientists join us, Dr. Jing Shi Yang and Stuart Johnson. And I would like to take a moment to introduce a couple other members of our team. In the event that you have a question or you're looking for something and you're wondering who can help me, well, I've already introduced Dolores. Dolores is not only does she support Alberta's approved farmers market program, she is our technical guru for today. So thank you, Dolores. <laughs> we also have Flavio Salinas, who is one of the business development officers um, at the, that supports companies out of the facility, and our business development unit manager, Cody Cunningham. One final thing before we start. I wanted to speak about the facility that we're in today which I'm very passionate about and very proud to be part of. The Food Processing Development Center, as we enter into 2024, is entering into the 40th year of bringing ideas to market. The Food Processing Development Center has a team of food scientists, processing technologists, food safety specialists, and business development officers that assist entrepreneurs, idea makers, and companies with innovation, product and process development, and commercialization of food products. 
Our mandate is to foster the growth and diversification of Alberta's value-added processing capacity through our unique combination of expertise, equipment, and this federally inspected processing facility. So if you have a 3D food printing idea or product coming into today's session that you're thinking about but not sure where to start, or you've come up with a challenge on a 3D product that you're already working on, well then I think you're in the right place. Together we can apply the research findings of the University of Alberta's professors and students and other academia, as well as apply the advancements shared by Coco Press and others to help bring your 3D food printed product idea to market. 3D food printing is just one of the areas of technology in which we can assist with. So, to carry on, I would now like to ask Dr. John Paluta to take the podium and lead us through the first presentation. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is John Malonko. Um, there. Oh, I didn't and, have to do that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give a, an introduction to 3D food printing um, and inherently we're going to talk a little bit about 3D printing at the outset and, and I know the audience, I'm not sure how familiar you are with 3D printing in general, 3D food printing, but uh, this is basically a condensed version of a course that I have given at the university, it's a one hour lecture, so condensed it a little bit, so it won't take an hour of your time. Uh, but hopefully it will be informative and hopefully it will set the stage for the other lectures coming up here. All right. All right. So what is 3D printing? And we've probably heard in the news 3D printing. It's become actually quite dominant in the news these days. It's part of Industry 4.0. It's, it's these new innovations that are taking over. Uh, and you'll see a lot of the really cool applications that 3D printing is, is doing. Uh, but one we're going to talk about today is 3D food printing. But 3D printing is a manufacturing process which creates these intricate three-dimensional solid objects from a digitized computer model. And you can see the uh, animated GIF that I put there. You can see it that slowly builds these layers up one at a time. So 3D printing is really a tool to, to make objects and, as you'll see, food minute here. So these objects are constructed by incrementally adding or building successive layers to create a 3D object and these can be made with a variety of materials and there's also a variety of manufacturing processes. 3D printing is not just one technology, it's actually a suite of technologies and even on the food side it's a suite of technologies. So keep that in mind. So it's about what kind of materials you need to, to print, what kind of technologies can do it. And you'll also hear the word additive manufacturing, and that's synonymous with 3D printing. This is a nice kind of diagram showing the difference between what we call conventional manufacturing and additive. So if you think about making a part or something, usually you start with a, a piece of material, like a chunk of steel, and you go through the process basically to, to put it in a lathe, to mill it, to, to take away material, and you end up with your intricate 3D object. Now, of course, that leaves a lot of waste. And so one of the benefits of using 3D printing is the fact that you minimize that waste. So it's kind of the opposite. You take your material and now you're just slowly building the structure you want. You're not wasting any material uh, and you're left with 3D object. Anyway, so that gives you, a, number one, why we call it additive manufacturing. Number two, highlights a little bit in terms of the uh, low waste issue. Okay, so what are the key advantages of 3D printing in general? Okay, number one, it can create complex shapes. Here's an example of a plastic uh, structure that can be built with a 3D printer. Um, it's adaptable, so if you have an idea for a design, you can actually do it without necessarily creating. Sometimes you can't even machine certain components without joining them, for example. You can replace complex assemblies. So, for example, in um, jet turbine engines, um, 
companies like Lockheed Martin are looking to use 3D printing of metals to replace a whole bunch of assemblies that they normally would have to build four or five parts. So there's actually real practical applications for this. Uh, there's various materials offer, uh, options that we'll talk about, minimizes waste, eliminates the need for costly tools or molds, so if you want to do uh, production, and allows direct production by end users. So the idea here, if you have one of these in your home, maybe one day, if you need a part for your washing machine or something, maybe they'll just send you the schematic through a 3D printer and you print it up. That would be great, obviously. Save a lot of money too. Okay, so what materials can be printed with just 3D printing? So we've seen plastics. So plastics is a really common 3D printer, uh, both in solid and liquid form. Metals, this is really the hot area of 3D printing now because they are using it as a primary fabrication tool in the metal industry. You can do ceramic cements. Uh, there are some large-scale demonstration of 3D printers where they're building houses. So this is actually an articulating arm where they're putting concrete to build that. And of course, we're good to foods. And we're talking to things like chocolate, sugar, dough, pasta, puree, vegetables, gels, etc. This is a long list that not only researchers have looked at, but people in their own homes have been experimenting with. In addition to foods, there's also biological materials, what we call bioprinting. And in that case, you're taking, uh, you know, cell cultures, so cultured to create cultured or lab-based meats. We'll talk about that a little bit. It also can be used as platforms for creating artificial organs, so in the medical field. So just to give you a feel that it's 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 everywhere now. So what are the basic steps in 3D printing? Well, you, you produce a model, a virtual model. It's all based on virtual models. So you take a, a 3D model, which you produce using computer-aided design or CAD, or you scan. You can also take a scan of an existing object and port that in. Um, and essentially you, you connect it to the 3D printer. It's not unlike any other printer. Now, in terms of what you need to do it, 3D model, model generation is, as I said, you use software for CAD, so AutoCAD, SolidWorks. There's a lot of free software on the internet if you want to do your own. Um, then you convert that, so it takes this solid model and it does a thing called slicing. Because the printer is doing a slice at a time, it actually does the conversion of the 3D, 3D geometry into slices, into an optimal way. From that, it generates a G-code, and that G-code is then used directly by this 3D printer. And G-code is a machine language that's used obviously in, in computer-controlled numerical machines for machining and all this, so it's a very common thing. So that's the way you do it. So you really need a printer, and you need a computer. Okay, let's talk about 3D printed foods, which is why we're here. So in terms of food printing technologies, and, and as I stated, 3D printing is a plethora of different technologies. It's not just one. But there's really three main ones for food that we're going to talk about today. So the first one is extrusion technology. So this is really for semi-solid foods, such as purees, pastes, gels. And that's what we're going to be demonstrating in the lab today with the demo. Um, and for those that are online, uh, presentations will be made available, so don't worry about taking notes. Um, I have a lot of YouTube videos that I'm going to have there for, for the guests that are online. You can see these technologies, how they work. Uh, second is what they call binder jetting. And binder jetting is really for solid granular foods, so powders, for example. It's crystalline sugar. How do you take that and make a 3D object from that? And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about bioprinting. As mentioned earlier, it's, it's really working with uh, cell cultures and trying to create biological replicates of things that we eat. And this is the point that other 3D printing processes are continually being developed. Continually. The literature is just, you know, it's exponential the number of publications in 3D printing. Okay, so extrusion processes, fairly simple. You have a small extruder on the head of an articulating 3D printer. So what happens is basically this goes back and forth in two directions in a plane, and you have a surface which essentially starts just to go up and down. 
Sometimes the head moves up and down and articulating. There's various ways to do that. But the sum of this is you're basically extruding uh, some sort of semi-solid. That cylinder that is, that is extruded in could be heated. So you can heat it and provide some, some uh, lower the viscosity, et cetera. So on the right is some example showing an extrusion of um, that looks like something for potentially baking. 3D printing, you can take these, you can post process them, you can put them in the oven, etc. The bottom left is a 3D printed pizza and other shapes and, and uh, items there. Binder jetting, a little bit different process now. So again, here we're now we're using powders. We're using, for example, in this case, different colors of crystalline sugar. Right, you can see uh, some interesting, interesting uh, confectionaries. And how it works basically is you have two beds. You have a powder bed, which essentially starts high, and a supply, a powder supply on the left, which starts low. So, and the, basically the mechanism here is you introduce a edible binder, a liquid form. And where you drop that binder, like an inkjet printer, that's where the solids are going to solidify. The powder is going to solidify there only. So what happens is you do that first layer, you, you basically make your shape at that very first layer. And uh, once that's completed, the powder bed moves down, the powder supply moves up, a roller pushes more powder on top of the first layer, and now you can add your second layer, you can add your, your binder. So you can create these very intricate shapes, multicolor, multi-flavor, fascinating. Third one, bioprinting. Much similar to the extrusion technology, except in this case, there's a number of processes ahead of time where you're culturing cells, etc. The actual placement of them can use various technologies, including extrusion to apply those, those cells. And as you see below is an example of a printer that uses it for um, lab-based meats, as an example. And one of the benefits of 3D printing for any sort of meat simulation is that you can get the marbling effect. So effectively you're using different materials, it's plant-based, you're using plant-based fats or fat to marble, and then you're using proteins and, or fiber for the other parts. So it's a, actually create a very good analog. So the advantage of 3D food printing, complex shapes, very similar to the slide we had previously. So for food, that really goes into the aesthetics or culinary side or specialty confectionaries, specialty bakery, uh, multiple colors and flavors, texture variation, uh, customer-driven options. So a lot of the, the interest in 3D food printing now is about personalized nutrition. Think of a scenario where maybe you're in a hospital, long-term care, you have a number of client, patients, maybe you require different nutritional uh, and just a laundry list, you know, uh, I put this link here from an online paper that you can get a list of all the different foods that have been tried and, and it's probably not even exhausted yet, but just to give you a feel that researchers have been looking at a, a lot of different options there. So what are the potential markets for the for 3D uh, printed foods? The one that's really, I think, definitely seems to have the hold on it right now see, is in the confectioner side. Definitely 3D printed chocolates you can buy online. Uh, same with candies, gummies, you name it. Um, bakeries, also at one. And in this case, you're, you're basically 3D printing dough. Um, food processes and manufacturing. So some larger manufacturers, and I have a case study I'm going to show in a minute here, showing how 3D food printing has been used in product development. Um, and the second one is not really a 3D printed food, but it's, it's for manufacturers in the sense 3D printing has also been used to create molds. So if you need to create silicone molds, you can actually do a 3D printer to do that. Uh, don't eat the mold though, it's not food. So, um, restaurants catering is another application. Um, healthcare, as I talked about with hospitals, long-term care, personalized nutrition. Uh, and then, of course, the other big market is domestic. When you look at plastic 3D printers, a majority of those are sold are actually sold to households. So the idea here is maybe one day we have an automated chef, 
download a recipe who and I'll, sorry, an alternative meets too, which is a, a growing area. Uh, a couple of case studies uh, to end this thing off. Uh, so Frito Lays who develop sun chips actually use 3D food printing to try to design the waviness of their chips. So if you read that, they they went through um, nine different prototypes with a vegetable slicer, but they did two dozen screening tests by creating uh, different style, uh, different uh, geometries of the chip. They were looking for a certain crunch. So it was a very intriguing application where they used a 3D printer to do this. Um, this is a article and all of the links that are provided at the bottom, you can click on to read more about it. But this is an example of using 3D printing to create foods for elderly and for conditions such as dysphagia where you have swallowing issues. Often the food is presented as in you know, a bowl, it's, it's very plain. The idea here is you're trying to create a very pleasantly aesthetic uh, food to, to eat. And Dr. Wisner later can probably talk to you know, the acceptance and the need for having these, you know, the visual. Sometimes we, we kind of put aside the aesthetics. Um, this is an example of an alternative steak that is plant-based. And I would advise you to look on the YouTube video because it really shows how they are manufacturing this with these multiple different types of layers of, of marbling, et cetera. It's quite fascinating. Of course, bioprinting of steaks, again, using real uh, meat cells, and bio inks, and, and this is ongoing. And, you know, that looks pretty good. It's quite impressive, actually, when you look at something like that and think that that is actually 3D printed. <laughs> And restaurants, 3D printing restaurants are happening in places around the world. They're not prevalent everywhere, uh, but it's interesting to see these happening. On the left, uh, Food Inc. is in, in London. Uh, on the right, that's sushi. You know, the, the amount of uh, intricacy that you see in that, not surprising, again, Japanese like their technology, so this, this is really something. And who knows what the future stands and uh, has for it. And if you're a Star Trek fan, uh, you know, press the button and maybe this is what we're gonna see. Maybe not in our lifetime, I don't know, but maybe this is the start of that. So last two slides, uh, there is a website that kind of talks about available food printers. So if you are interested in looking to see what is available, what options, etc., check this website out, that's for your benefit. And I've also provided, uh, a list of YouTube videos on various topics of 3D food printing that will be in the, the slide deck um, after you can click on the hyperlinks and, and take a look. And I want to thank my uh, grad student Danielle for kind of putting this together. So, and with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Um, in the next little bit here, we're just going to our next. Um, presenter is doing it online, so it'll just take us a moment to sure. uh, hook that up. So be patient with me, everybody online. Is <laughs> there any question? That's printed. Is it available? Can you buy it now? Like you said, they have sushi and popcorn. Yeah. Uh, well, as I said, I think the, the most commercial is probably infection areas and, and those sorts of things. And definitely you can go online and purchase 3D. We, our lab has bought various 3D products, um, you know, stuff that, that you will be shipped to you. I don't know if I've ever seen anything in the stores here per se. But can I go to a restaurant and order a steak? Well, no, no, I don't, well, I, I don't know. I've not seen a, a 3D printed steak on the menu in Edmonton, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, actually to that, one of the, one of the projects that we're working on right now in conjunction uh, with the grant from Alberta Innovates is looking at um, how, if there's any businesses that have considered using 3D food printing to see if we've seen anything or not. And, and unfortunately at this point, not really, but there there is some interest. So I think it's coming, but you know, yeah, it's a slow process as you can understand to commercialize something. All right. All right. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Rupesh, hopefully, we will hear you and you can hear us. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? You bet, you bet. So, yeah, and also you can see the screen, right? 
Yes. Okay, good. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, uh, thank Michelle, you, for the introduction, Michelle. and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this uh, webinar. So today I will uh, talk about my research on 3D footprint. Uh, focusing on a couple of my uh, research projects uh, at the University of Alberta. Uh, my name is Rupesh, I'm a research professor at the University of Alberta, focusing on food safety and engineering. So these two projects, uh, the first one is about the like, improvement of uh, plant protein reprintability, and the second one is about uh, microbial inactivation using uh, 3D footprint. So I would like to thank my students over the time uh, because of you know they do all the research work uh, and to thank you everyone uh, for uh, you know contributing to the research work. So the first project uh, that is about the improvement of uh, uh, 3D printability of uh, plant protein gels by plasma activated plasma water, water. microbial water. and this is a part of the project uh, funded by Alberta Innovates uh, with. Uh, uh, Dr. Vilotko and also part of the Ensor Create project with Dr. Chen and the students working on these projects are uh, Slashmi and uh, Pauline. So before jumping into this uh, project uh, details, I would like to mention some of the emerging applications of uh, 3D footprinting. Uh, the first one is about uh, uh, the, the cellular agriculture. Uh, for example, you might have heard about the cultured meat or the meat uh, Lab or lab, right? So, meats to grow, uh, they use certain like scaffolds. So, 3D printed plant based scaffolds can be very suitable for uh, meat cells uh, uh, to grow. So, this is, I believe, there is a big application of uh, 3D footprinting and also other applications like uh, you might have heard about the you know plant based meat products, egg and uh, uh, seafood analogs. So there have been like a lot of research uh, happening on these areas, uh, like uh, the development of uh, plant-based meat, uh, seafood, and uh, egg analogs. So plant proteins, uh, you know, they are good candidates uh, for uh, 3D footprinting. And we know that uh, Canada has a large agriculture area, and uh, uh, you know we produce a lot of uh, plant proteins, like uh, pulse proteins. But when we talk about uh, 3D printing of uh, plant proteins or any other material, there are a couple of uh, important properties. The first is the printability. So that means like, uh, especially with the extrusion uh, 3D printing, you know, we should be able to extrude that product through this uh, 3D printing nozzle. So the printability or the viscoelastic properties of the 3D printing inks, that is very important. And the second uh, property is the storage stability. That means if uh, you print a product, uh, you know the, the bottom layer should be able to withstand the weight of the top layers of the printed product. So that product should be structurally stable. So a couple of important properties. The first is the printability and the second is the, the storage stability or the resistance to deformation. But when we look at the plant protein printability or their resistance to deformation, we need actually, you know, there, there's a need for improvement. So we used a technology called, called plasma technology to improve printability and uh, the resistance to deformation of plant proteins recently. So that is a project I would like to uh, talk about first. Uh, but what is this called plasma technology? You might have heard about uh, plasma. Plasma is the fourth state of matter. It's basically the freshly ionized gas with high energy. So you can actually break down gases to much smaller components by providing energy. So plasma can be created uh, by breaking gases. By, and it's a mix of uh, different uh, uh, charges, like positive charges, negative charges. So for example, if you give energy to a uh, for example, ice, if you give energy to ice or heat the ice, you get water, right? And if you give energy to a liquid, you get gas. And if you give energy to a gas, we can create plasma. So plasma is a four state, uh, four state uh, by providing energy to a gas, and you can actually break down the gas into much smaller components. And if you look at the universe, uh, more than 99% of the visible matter that is in the plasma state, 
examples are like a northern lights is the plasma lightning in this example of uh, plasma and we use uh, you know uh, plasma tvs fluorescent labs in those uh, applications you know we use plasma plasma technology but in the lab you can actually create plasma at uh, low temperature conditions uh, that is by providing electrical energy so you can actually create plasma by breaking down the gas uh, by giving electrical energy uh, that is by flowing a gas through a electric field you can break down the, the gas into electrons uv ions reactive oxygen species react nitrogen species and other charged particles so here we have to remember that you are converting a gas into plasma by breaking that down and it contains a lot of reactive species like as i mentioned here so these reactive species can actually interact with the proteins uh, for example if you use plant proteins and you can actually modify the properties of these proteins so that's what actually we utilized so recently we did some studies on the use of plasma technology to improve the gelation properties of plant proteins and the parent funding and we published this work also recently so then we expanded that work uh, to our current project uh, there we use this plasma technology to improve the 3d quality of uh, pea protein gels and here we use basically plasma activated microbubble water so uh, in this case the plasma was created or generated inside the water like you generate lightning in the water but again by using a gas we inject this plasma into this uh, gas and convert uh, that water into plasma activated microbubble water so for creating this plasma activated microbubble water we use a bubble uh, spark discharge reactor it looks like this so basically you are creating uh, you know the lightning in the water and converting that water into plasma activated microbubble water uh, remember we use uh, different we can use different gases because the gas is basically broken down into plasma right so in this uh, project we used uh, 100 percent of air uh, then argon and a mixture of argon and air uh, that is 90 to 10 uh, air and that was named as arg 90 and then um, 80 argon and 20 air that is arg 80 so after that we use this plasma activated microbubble water uh, to make the p protein suspension so uh, you know instead of using the digital water uh, we use the plasma activated microbubble water and uh, we created or we we prepared this protein suspension by using this and then we use the heat gelation heating and cooling to make the p protein gels after making the p-protein gels, uh, we analyze the viscoelastic properties and mechanical properties of these gels. And our control sample was the p-protein gels prepared by using distilled water. Then after that, we uh, 3D printed uh, these p-protein gels, the 3D printed products, like and we use our uh, footboard 3D printer uh, for making these gels. And this uh, demonstration of this uh, football printer will be uh, happening in uh, later um, at uh, Leduc. So um, then we looked at the printability of this uh, 3D printed foods. Uh, we took the photographs, we did the deformation studies, like a dimensional changes of these uh, 3D printed foods over the time. So when we looked at the, uh, the viscoelastic properties of these pea protein gels, uh, we found that uh, the gels prepared by using the plasma activated microbubble water they had a different uh, uh, viscoelastic properties for example the g prime g double prime values of arg 80 and arg 90 so that means like the mixture of argon and air that was used to create this plasma activated microbubble water and that water was used to make the gels right so arg 80 and arg 90 they had a higher viscoelastic properties or uh, the rheological properties and that means the gel rigidity of the uh, gels prepared by the plasma activated microbubble water that was higher compared to those prepared by distilled water and then we also looked at the compressive strength compressive strain and Young's modulus of this uh, uh, gels p protein gels and uh, there also we found that uh, 
those prepared by ARG-90 and ARG-80, they had higher compressive strength, compressive strain, and also Young's modulus. So that means uh, higher compressive strength means uh, the structural stability of the uh, 3D printed foods. That's much higher compared to the, the gels prepared by distilled water. And also compressive strain means like a, uh, it's a, the gels are like a more resistant to fracture. So that is very important in the case of extrudability of the 3D printed foods. Because during the 3D printing process, during the extrusion, there should not be any fracture or break of that uh, printed material during the printing process. So higher compressive strain is uh, important. And also Young's modulus, uh, higher Young's modulus means uh, lesser deformation uh, during the storage. So the, the printed material, uh, as I mentioned before, the bottom layer of the printed material should be able to withstand the top layers, right? The weight of the top layers. So higher Young's modulus is important to uh, keep that 3D printed material, uh, you know, without any caving in or uh, without any structural deformation. And then uh, we looked, uh, we took the photos of the 3D printed uh, products. And as you can see, the, the one prepared by distilled water, they are not really printable. But on the other hand, the one prepared by ARG-90 and ARG-80, uh, like the plasma activated microbubble water, they were able to withstand the shape and also structurally and uh, you know, dimensionally more accurate. Uh, they were able to retain the shape and structure. Uh, and uh, uh, over the period of time, like during the storage also, uh, the, the changes in the dimensions of these uh, 3D printer gels, those were higher or the, the changes were minimal for the ARG-90 and ARG-80 compared to the digital water. So obviously there is a, you know, uh, uh, you know the plasma activated microbubble water is there uh, to prepare like a more, uh, like a better uh, 3D printed pea protein gels. Then we wanted to understand what is the possible mechanism of the improved gelation and improved printability of this uh, uh, gel prepared by plasma activated microbubble water. Um, we determined the, the different reactive species. Uh, remember, the reactive species, they are the ones responsible for the changes in the you know, protein structure and their functional properties, right? So, in the plasma activated microbubble water, we have different reactive species like ozone peroxide, nitrate, and nitrite. So these all reactive species could contribute to the changes in the protein structure and their functional properties. Uh, in our previous work, we did, uh, you know, we analyzed the mechanisms associated with the, the changes in the functional properties. And uh, we reported that uh, there was like a, the changes in the protein uh, tertiary structure the partial unfolding is happening when we treat these proteins with the cold plasma technology. And also there was an oxidation of the protein and uh, there may be like more formation of disulfide bonds in the proteins and uh, hydrogen bonding. Ultimately, the cross-link is happening to a better structural uh, for the plasma. And then, like this is a very project because we need to do more studies happen in the plasma microbubble because we can the effect of argon species. So argon is also a, a gas we used here in this project. So we couldn't determine the argon species concentration. So that may be also impacting the properties change in the case of uh, uh, protein functionalities. So that's about the first project. Uh, the second project is about uh, microbe inactivation during 3D food printing. And uh, the student project, uh, Julia, and uh, uh, supervised by uh, myself and uh, Dr. Volotko. Uh, if you look at the food safety of 3D printed products, uh, it's not really well studied. You don't see a lot of studies on the food safety aspect, uh, but food safety is very important in the case of uh, 3D printed products because uh, you know, many of the 3D printed products, they don't require pre or post processing. Uh, most of them are like ready to consume a product. So in those ready to consume products, uh, we need to make sure that uh, the products are microbiologically safe. 
uh, we know that heating is a conventional method because microorganisms are very sensitive to temperature. So you can actually inactivate microorganisms by heating process, right? Uh, but when we look at uh, many of the 3D printers available, you can see that uh, uh, many of them, uh, they use uh, heat also. Like uh, you can actually heat the product before or during the printing process. And we know that if you use heat, definitely there will be turbine activation. So uh, that is very important. Like uh, the, the, the printer we are using at, in our lab, that also can actually you know, uh, heat the product while printing or even before printing. And in that case, we had to understand the printability or quality change also uh, if we use heat. We know that microbe inactivation will happen, but along with that, printability and quality changes, that also will change. So it is important to optimize uh, or find out the optimal time temperature uh, for uh, the microbe inactivation and also quality changes. So the objective of this work was to evaluate uh, if the effect of uh, selected time temperature combinations on microbe inactivation for producing safe to consume 3D printed products. For this work, uh, we used commercially available snack pack uh, pudding uh, that was available in the market. And then what we did was we that product is and then we did 3D printing. And after that, we put a salmonella infection during the heat printing process. This was the uh, 3D printing. 3D printer, which is a printing barrel, and uh, in the barrel there is a heat, and uh, the product is inside. Rupesh, we're having a bit of problems with your audio. There's it's there's a lot of clicking in the background. Oh, okay. so, so I will try my headphone. It's good right now, but we can't hear you. <laughs> can't hear you. No. Still can't hear you, sorry. No, no, not hearing you yet, sorry. So how about now? Got you now. Yeah, we can hear you now. So this is how uh, it's better. So I will continue. Okay. okay. So uh, we were talking about the 3D printing process. So inside this uh, syringe, uh, there is a, uh, uh, we can actually fill the syringe with the product. And you can also see the nozzle here. So that is a printing nozzle here. So this uh, syringe is inside this uh, heating barrel. So the heating barrel, there is a resistive heater and you can actually heat the product. Um, and then we monitored the temperature of the product at different locations of the uh, uh, this syringe. And uh, we also looked at uh, the you know, the we had a, some target temperatures, like the printer temperatures, like your 55, 58, 61, and 64 degrees Celsius. So that was a target temperature we wanted to achieve for the product. And we named uh, uh, that uh, target cells A, B, C, and D. And uh, we also used different times. These are the different times of heating of the product, like 10, 20, 30, and 40 minutes. So different temperatures we use and also different time combinations. 
but actually the temperature reached was like a little bit uh, higher compared to the target temperatures because of uh, like the, the, the heater was uh, like overshooting uh, so eventually we got like a constant temperature uh, for the product then we looked at the salmonella inactivation uh, we found that the salmonella population was significantly reduced during the heating at uh, these temperatures like 55 to 64 degrees celsius and if you look at the salmonella reduction uh, we found that it's uh, more than uh, two log that means uh, more than 99 percentage of the salmonella reduction uh, during the uh, heating even at 55 degrees celsius after 40 minutes and in the case of uh, 61 and 64 degrees celsius the salmonella reduction was like a uh, more than seven log so that's a very significant uh, uh, salmonella reduction during the uh, heating and printing process. So here, this uh, 10, 20, 30, and 40 minutes, that includes heating plus printing. So printing uh, you know, can be completed within like a two and a half minutes. So the remaining is heating. But if you look at the product, the product cannot be heated very fast. So it takes some time to heat the product. So to achieve the constant uh, temperature, target temperature, it takes some time. So as you can see, uh, it is called the come up time here. So the time taken to achieve the target temperature. So those are the come up times. So the come up times, during that come up time, there is a change in the temperature. But once you achieve the temperature, it's more or less constant. So heating was happening at different temperatures because you know the, the product temperature was going up and then it becomes almost a constant okay so that is very important um, and uh, also i want to mention that uh, even at uh, 61 and 64 degrees celsius um, even at uh, shorter times like 20 minutes we were able to get significant reduction in the salmonella population mm -hmm. then we also determined the time needed for 90 percent reduction in salmonella population so you you know those who are in the food microbiology area or the canning process you know you know about the the decimal reduction time that is the time for 90 percent reduction in a microbial population so in this case we determined the the d value or the decimal reduction time um, and we found that uh, for the temperature combination c and d at uh, 61 and 64 degrees celsius we were able to achieve more than Oh, we were able to uh, get um, you know 90 percent reduction in the salmonella even less than uh, five minutes so that is very important like because it, at this combination we can get uh, salmonella reduction within five minutes time and uh, here we also used a subscript called v dv because that indicates variable temperature because in the case of decimal reduction time determination we always use a constant temperature but in the case of 3D printing and heating, uh, there is a temperature increase happening and then it becomes constant. So we use the variable dV uh, as the, uh, you know, to indicate the decimal reduction time. Um, and we also determine the Z value for the salmonella. So the conclusion is that uh, this is like a very limited research happening in this uh, 3D printed foods, especially in the case of uh, food safety aspect. So there's like a more uh, studies are needed and most of the studies were focusing on printability and qualitative analysis uh, and uh, we also found that uh, the 3d printing with the heated extrusion so that can be used to reduce microbial pathogens with the proper selection of the time and temperature combinations so that is very important like the time and temperature combination selected uh, that will be important and then you need to actually connect that with the printability and other quality changes in the 3d printed products so those are the main um, conclusions here and also you know at ufa we are actually looking for a uh, collaborative uh, collaboration opportunity in the 3d printing research so we are looking for like industry partners researchers focusing on like a 3d printability of different types of products like a plant and animal proteins uh, starches other biomaterials and the applications can be like encapsulation, uh, cell culture, scaffold development, plant-based meat, cheese, or seafood development. Um, and we are planning to submit a, a letter of intent uh, to the Alberta Consortium for funding in the future. Uh, so if you are interested, please uh, contact us. Uh, 
um, you know you can you know my email id is there and also uh, my website information is also there so if you are interested please contact me um, that's all and i would like to thank uh, our uh, funding support from different agencies especially alberta innovates and also ensor create for funding this project uh, that's all uh, if you have any question please let me know so for those of you online, please go to um, the top and type in your questions. Um, and I'll open it up to the people here. Go ahead. Have you done any research on biofilm formation within the print heads? Um, no, not yet. I think that's an important aspect, especially like, you know, inside the 3D printer. You're talking about inside the 3D printers, right? So yeah, I mean, we haven't done any work. But I believe there are some studies related to sanitation of the 3D printers. Uh, some research work has been done and published in the, uh, you know, by others. Uh, but that is important uh, over the period of time. We need to do any biofilm formation inside and also how you properly sanitize these 3D printers um, after the use. Are there any other questions in the room here? No, there is not, Rupesh. So thank you very much for your presentation and we will get ready for our next speaker in just one moment. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Our well, presentation's not showing. Oh, I know. Hang on. I have to move this back out of the way. One moment, please. Hmm. You're good to go. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Wendy Wismer. And just a little bit of context to where we are here. So Dr. Wolodko gave us a really great overview of you know, what is 3D food printing and what are the products that can result from that, uh, that processing equipment. And then Dr. Rupesh really zoomed in to tell us about some of the challenges around the formulations because not everything you print holds its shape, which is a little bit disappointing. And then he's also emphasized that we still need to make sure that these new formulations and these new processes are giving us products that are, are safe. And then we had that really good question about maintaining the safety and quality of the machine too. So I'm gonna pull out and I'm gonna talk about business and consumer perceptions of 3D food printing. Or will I? Oops, oh, sorry, that's me. Okay, there we go, thank you. So you saw some great pictures in the presentations about what you can do with 3D food printing, and here's a few more pictures, and some of them of the products look quite simple. So on the far left there, we have some pasta that's produced by Barilla in their European facility. And we see that there's great uptake in terms of pasta. At the bottom here, we have some cakes so a really intricate design on the top of the cake and then the profile of it it looks like a, a chocolate mountain and we can see the intricate shapes of the chocolates and emphasizing that one of the great things about the 3d food printing is that you do have access to that 3d structure so while items such as the cake really focus on the surface and what you see, you can also work at the structure of the product as well. And we see that above with the meat, so that cell-based meat, and we've got uh, two heads of a, of a printer, and we have one stream producing the fat, the other the meat, and as Dr. Wolodko said, putting those together so that we end up with this fibrous marbled structure. 
and on the far. I'm going to pause you. I'm having issues with getting this screen to show online. So sorry. Okay, keyboard share. So sorry. That's okay. Not letting me share the screen. Sorry, Rupesh is not letting me have my my screen back. <laughs> okay. So sorry for the delay, everyone. Technical issues. Learning as we go here. Sort of relaxing. Oh, we days, do right? need some oh, music here. I'm so sorry like here. <laughs> I, hi, Dolores. I tried to get him to undo it and he's left, so I'm going to send him an email for you. I actually booted him out by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Let that be a warning to you. Yeah, because I don't like you anymore. It was like, oh my goodness. Okay, it is not giving me the option to share. So the question about the shape of the pasta, it's usually sold unfilled. So my understanding of the process is that a lot of these are frozen and then you purchase them online and pick them up or deliver them. And then you take them home and sort of continue the artistry. So you could fill it on your own or you know, they serve it in sauce. And I find, you know, this is the picture I found, but there are a lot more intricate ones as well. And even, I'll just keep answering that question. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Everybody ask questions in here. Well, I've been around the technical difficulties. <laughs> and on my right here, this is a, a restaurant example, and this is also pasta. And you can see it's a much larger, shape and our chef is filling actually the different holes with different materials okay so don't think you know just traditional small pasta shape you know it's the boundaries are not limitless but they're quite extensive okay i believe we are good to go now <laughs> okay all right so we have the restaurant pasta shape uh and then our last example is over on the far left there and that's an example of a granular product. So using that binder jetting technology that Dr. Wolofko mentioned, and it's a drink bomb. It's made by Poseidon in Quebec. And you put that in your glass and then you pour an alcoholic beverage over top of it and it dissolves and it adds flavor, color and excitement to your beverage. And you can also buy little chocolate teddy bears that you would drop into a warm liquid and you can make a hot chocolate. So there are lots of really, really cool applications. So while there are many benefits and unique properties of 3D printed foods, and you see pictures in the media and, and online, you know, what are the attitudes of consumers and food businesses towards these products? There must be some reservation somewhere, and yet at the same time, we have lots of people who are early adopters of the, the technology. So what is it that is different among the adopters and those who are a little bit slower or perhaps not interested in all at all in taking up this technology. So what is their thinking or feeling about this particular product that is dictating their behavior? So as we've seen, 3D food printing is widely used and has really been adopted in some sectors like manufacturing, automotive, and aerospace. And 3D food printing is growing in the food industry and the most well-established applications are in bakery and confectionery, protein alternatives, which would be the meat that we've seen, pasta, food service, and also healthcare. So Dr. Wolodko has provided a lot of background there. And we could look generally at what are food business attitudes towards 3D food printing and what are seen as factors that would 
uh, encourage a business to adopt 3D food printing and what might be perceived barriers or disadvantages. Our graduate student, Daniela Boheta, uh, performed an interview-based study with nine different food companies around the globe who had adopted 3D food printing and had a business, a restaurant or a production facility where they were actually making the products. And of these nine businesses, as you can see on the far left, four were in confectionery, two in food service, two were producing protein alternatives, and one was in healthcare. And she used a model uh, called diffusion of innovation to determine who was an early adopter, um, the early majority, and then, sorry, I lost my train of thought there, and the late majority in the laggards wouldn't yet be um, in the industry. So as I mentioned, she used this diffusion of innovation model to develop her questions and then interpret the data. And you look at the process by which there are existing conditions. So that would just be the prior conditions. What's the state of uh, awareness at that time? And then developing the state of knowledge, you know, the awareness that there is something called 3D food printing uh, and what are the things you can produce. And then investigating a bit more and getting into that persuasion stage where you look at really the relative advantage, you know, what will it do for me? Given what I'm doing now, will 3D food printing be a real asset for me? Is it compatible with what I do? Am I making something that can be produced in a 3D food printer? You know, how complex is it? and then working on the trial ability, maybe giving it a try and observing whether it works. So there's this whole stage of sort of consideration and trying it out, then moving on to this decision to adopt or reject, maybe because it isn't a fit, implementation, scaling up, producing it, and if it's a go, confirming that it works, or it might also be that it really doesn't work for a particular group. So looking at this flow of information, where, um, where were the advantages and the barriers to this implementation and adoption? So with respect to catering, just a couple of examples here for the industries uh, in terms of relative advantages. If you think of catering and doing traditional cooking, advantages were that you could make really unique and intricate items, you know, more intricate and more unique than what could be made with a pastry bag or any other kind of machines. You could also upcycle foods, so use um, products that might normally go to soup or other things like that, and there was reduced plastic consumption, and found that there were multiple applications, so multiple foods could be printed. In terms of restaurants and confectionery, if you think about molding, you know, pouring something into a mold and you get a wonderful shape on the outside and a fairly homogeneous product on the inside, it was found that the designs that could be made with 3D food printing were again far more creative and you could also get that three-dimensional structure rather than the homogeneous infill that you get with a mold. In healthcare too, Molding provided a superior presentation of texture modified foods. So for those individuals who have difficulty chewing and difficulty swallowing, swallowing and are on a pureed diet, there can be real advantages to 3D printed foods in, in addition to adding uh, in the nutrients that are unique to that particular individual's needs. For the protein alternatives, um, single extrusion was the method that was replaced by the 3D food printing using dual extrusion and things that were more complicated, as we've said, to make that network of the meat fibers and also the, the fat. And at the meat level, it was found to be scalable and efficient. So you've seen the images of those larger pieces of meat, often with something like chocolate or the confectionery, you know, you're making one little thing at a time, but it is possible to make these larger pieces. So real advantages. So just as a, a visual example, here we have a broccoli, which we all take for granted, I'm sure, 
but you know the great thing about broccoli is it has that wonderful sort of frilly flowery part at the top and if you're on a puree diet the broccoli is blended with a bit of liquid and you put it into a mold and the result may look something like that so it's a general broccoli shape but it certainly doesn't have quite the appeal of the real thing and this would be what you can get with 3d printing so you can see that you can generate that very intricate uh, intricate uh, detail on the surface of that flowery bit and also um, greater definition of the stalks. So while it still um, is maybe a little bit limited, nothing can replace the real thing, it's a much better image than the molded product. So what were some of the barriers to adoption identified by uh, the, the businesses? Really, it's economies of scale. So with the technology where we are right now, a lot of it tends to be fairly small scale and the printing is quite slow. So we haven't got to a point where we have that mass production, like we do um, you know, filling water or beer or making chocolate chips or something like that. It still is a lot more unique and while you can set up multiple printer heads and do many products at one time, it still is quite piecemeal and better suited to products that are, are unique and printed one at a time. So the printers can be relatively high in cost and it results in a product that you would probably charge a premium for. Um, in terms of the rate of adoption, it's still early days and there aren't a lot of large companies involved and there's still relatively low demand for printers, but it is, it is moving. And so it, we anticipate that we will get to a point where things do scale up and the technology improves and becomes faster and less expensive as we see in pretty much everything. So the consumer was seen as a barrier to uptake of 3D printed food products. Low awareness, and I know some of you have come into the room and said, oh, I don't know anything about 3D food printing, and that's why I'm here. It certainly isn't something that everyone is aware of, and I think we have to acknowledge that everybody can't know everything. You know, there will be some limitation stuff to eat just because there are so many different things that are available and not everything comes into your window. Negative or reluctant perception to adopt. You know, my experience with that curry coffee maker at the back <laughs> made me realize that not all technology is great. So while it is an incredibly efficient, simple machine, I did press the wrong button and I restarted the machine and then it didn't make coffee, but it heated and just like, Oh, okay, so maybe for me, a, a simple pour over is probably my, you know, where I buy in for technology, and then other people will buy in with a, a multi-cup coffee maker. So I think that's another thing is we have to be aware that while technology provides a lot of benefits, it isn't all things to all people, and there may be items that really appeal to people that are high tech, but then in other areas, they, you know, they decline to, to use the high tech. So there's very much this individual variation for consumer. And that lack of willingness to pay for expensive or, or premium products. So that might be one of the niches that 3D food printing has is those premium products rather than uh, everyday products. So in conclusion, while early adopters identified many advantages of the process compared to the traditional technologies they had used, they were very specific applications and they felt that that scale up, those economies of scale would really benefit from the industry. And their suggestions were to enhance consumer perception that marketing and educational strategies would be beneficial, plus incorporation of consumer feedback to better understand what consumers would like. I might have done that. <laughs> That's okay. Good segue. <laughs> so speaking of consumers, here we are. So what about consumer attitudes toward 3D food printing? So I mentioned 
you know, not all technologies appeal to all people. And I think something to think about here too is that you can buy a printer for your home. So there's a buy-in where the consumer says, yes, that's a great technology. I'm going to make those products at home. But then there's also the willingness to buy the products of the, the 3D technology. So there are those two different aspects. I think something to remember too is that there's so much new that uh, the consumer sees. So this idea in the food industry that we have um, industry 4.0 that contains these different elements. So focused on plant-based food, insect protein, cell cultured meats, the 3D printed foods, the use of ugly produce and byproducts, uh, personalized foods, personalized nutrition, gene editing foods, different novel food production systems. So there are lots of things that are new and different for the consumer, and some are better accepted than others. And perhaps part of the question is, well, why is that? And uh, a couple of researchers who do a lot of things with consumer science, so Tourillion and Hartman said that for these new or novel food products, we require a, a deep understanding of the consumer and the traits of the product that determine its acceptance or rejection. And there are examples there were the insects, the container is a high protein product, and then we have a meatless burger. And there are many different things going on in the mind of the consumer there. So for the uh, insects, it might be, you know, disgust. And we even see a little bit of that with things that are produced by machines like 3D food printers is that, you know, something that you make by hand, that you create, that you make with love is a good thing. But something that is processed, you know, processed foods or comes from a machine is not a good fit. And that doesn't hold true for everyone, but it is good to know that that philosophy is, is out there. Not being familiar with things. Um, even though, you know, as was pointed out, we use printers in our daily life, food printing is not so familiar. So there is a, a barrier there with that idea that um, we normally produce things that we don't eat with printing, not, not food products. Food neophobia is the reluctance to try something new. So something that looks really fun, which might be those drink bombs, could be really appealing to a lot of people. <laughs> whereas other people might consider that to be, you know, just, just really strange and not something that they would be willing to try. And that food technology neophobia is something similar where um, consumers are not comfortable with, and in some cases fear, have a reluctance to adopt new technologies. So there would be a variety of, of those that would include the 3D food printing. And then a lack of perceived naturalist. You know, we have a great focus now, especially in the younger generations, on things that are sustainable, natural, plant-based, you know, things you can touch and feel, things that warm your heart. And 3D food printing may not be a great fit there, um, at least at, at this particular time. So it's a very complex situation. So Daniela and uh, her colleague, Laura Lopez, developed a model of factors that uh, reflect consumer attitudes to 3D food printing. And I apologize, this is very small, but I think the focus really here is the idea that in addition to those factors that were on the previous slide, there's so much else that's involved. So things even like age, gender, <clears throat> pardon me, your employment status and your education level, and then, <clears throat> pardon me, also the products of the characteristics. So if you are an individual, or sorry, the characteristics of the food product, the sensory characteristics. So if you are an individual on a pureed diet, you know, there will be greater benefits and greater attraction to 3D food printed products than perhaps an individual who doesn't see a need for those products at all. So there are a wide variety of factors to, to consider when we think about consumerism. 
So we have a lot of uh, food technologies that provide a lot of benefits to us, but finding that sweet pot spot, that balance between the technological push and the consumer demand for products lies somewhere in the middle. And as I said before, it won't be all products that appeal to all consumers. There we go, there's our great creation. So I should mention that the second part to Daniela's uh, research is a survey. She's interested in finding out from businesses in Alberta if you are interested in adopting 3D food printing or what your perceptions of 3D food printing might be. So if that, if that is you, if you are a member of the food industry, you could scan that QR code and that will bring you right up to the survey. And there's a little bit more detail about participation there. And that concludes my presentation. <clears throat> and I'm happy to answer some questions now. I feel probably a lot of them could be directed to Daniela, who's joined us at the back there. Or if you think about them later, you can send an email. So there's some questions. I have one online here, but I'm not sure if it's you who's going to answer this or Rupesh. With something like protein alternatives, what is the time frame for making, for example, a 3D printed eight ounce steak? Oh, you know, I think that's a question for Daniela. Okay. <laughs> so talk loud, Daniela, please. <laughs> We're going to make her come up to the front of the room. <laughs> so it depends on the printers that are commercially available. Um, but there is a printer that was developed in Spain and they take like nine minutes for it to make a one kilogram, per se. Um, but again, it depends on the shape and the ingredients that you use. Um, yeah, that's kind of my point of reference. Okay, uh, another question we have, again, not sure if this is for you. How, how do you stabilize the heating temperature in 3D printing food? So you can uh, control the temperature in two spots in a 3D food printer. One is in the nozzle side, so you will see a syringe. You can control all syringe that it will pour in the ingredients, but you also can control the base of the 3D food printer. All right, perfect. So, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. So, uh, during printing time, does food safety become an issue? Yes. So, uh, depending on the ingredients that you are using, uh, you may have to you have to have control of the temperature that you are using. Depends obviously on the microbial growth that you will have there. Uh, most of the ingredients that you are using are raw. So basically, while you will print it, but you will have to cook it close to the Will that change the shape of the reactor? Yeah, of course. So it also depends on the formulation that you will do. So you will try to keep like a stable uh, printing, but making sure that the post printing will not affect it as much. But there, there is also something really important there that. We are calling something that is for the printing, so you can play with the texture and also the shape of the printers uh, after printing them. So that's like another opportunity of 3D printing that you can also play with the, with the change of the shape uh, post printing. So in, in additive manufacturing, occasionally in plastics, you'll have like a scaffolding within the structure that you print with like a secondary material that that gets dissolved away. Is that possible in food printing to get more intricate structures or how would that work? So as what I know, for example, we uh, 3D print the meat. What they do is to scan like a steak, a normal um, uh, meat steak, and they scan and have the 3D shape and they can identify the layers of fat and protein in there. What, it, what they do with 3D food printer is to exactly mimic the layers. So you know you won't have one um, extruder. You will have multiple extruders that will print exactly like fat and protein and yeah, the main tube of, of a meat. So that will be the shape 
of the three grids of meat. So the three different grinding also consists in the layers. So you will have not only the 3D shape with the uh, different extruders, but also with the layers. So in one layer, you will have a variation of the meat, of the protein, and the fat content. So in that way, you will have that. But I also know about the culture cell coupled with 3D printing. So with culture cell, they are trying to do the scaffold, and then with with cells trying to join them, like to couple them with the scaffold. I'm not sure like how it really work, work, what works, uh, but I have an idea that it's really trying to do it in that way. Sure. I was just wondering because there are some hollow shaped confectionery images in some of the presentations. And so I was curious if how they would support the structures of those hollow so in that way you need to have a stable formulation so in that that's where you start playing with the formulation to stabilize it and also it, it impacts the room, te room temperature so if you have like a really really warm temperature you won't have like it will melt down yeah. for chocolates so yeah that's so you cool it exactly. you cool it and also it depends on the temperature of the chocolate so we've done things like print onto a cold platform, <clears throat> for me, and then have a fan going at the same time to cool it quickly. Yeah, I was curious. Uh, can you, like, if you buy one of those printers at home, uh, can you chop, I don't know, uh, chamber and make a make something out of it, put it in a paste, and print it yourself? How how hacky can you get with it? Because, <laughs> but a good one. You, wanna... <laughs> uh, you know, and I think that's the temptation, and maybe all the beautiful images we see suggest that well, you can just take things and you put it through this nozzle and you and you get a shape. But then, as Rupesh's research kind of points out, it's like, oh, but not everything holds its shape. Sometimes it needs to be baked. Um, it often requires something else like if you know cucumber would just be so runny it might need a little bit of a gel or a gum or something like that in order to hold the sheet what do you think have you tried the cucumber i want to try the cucumber but i know that there are some uh, opportunities on upcycling so what they do is to use let's say those produce that are that look pretty good and they combine it with bread so the bread is playing the role of trying to hold shape in there. So you will have to do like that combination of ingredients to have like a stable ink. There are some kind of nutritious vegetable and fruit formulations that are being described in the literature as researchers try and make something that would be really appealing to kids. So that idea, if you could make mm -hmm. the fruits and vegetables more appealing to kids, print out dinosaur shapes and things like that, you'll get more, more uptake. And, those often have just a little bit of gums to them or something, or maybe water reduction first, make your fruit puree, and then reduce some of the moisture that, and then get something that's thicker and a little bit easier to print. All right, well, let's take our short break right now. One more, one more question, yeah, okay, go one for it. Questions yeah, so I think the consumer right now, the understanding of 3D printing is in plastics. I would say that's sort of what the most popular group. But in terms of perception, it's really not any different. Or in reality, I should say, it's not really any different than putting a product in a piping bag and squeezing it out. It's just that 3D printing is much more controlled and much more precise. So what can we do as uh, food researchers and food manufacturers to help you know bridge that gap that this isn't like printing plastic. This is more like using a pipe. I think part of it would be to convey that message. Yes. Um, however, I think I, I want to say something like well spoken as a food scientist, right? Like that maybe is how we see 3D food printing. It's really not different from a piping bag. But for other individuals, it's very very different you know it's just it's a machine 
making things as opposed to you standing there with a piping bag and extruding it and controlling the design and making sure everything is okay. You know, I, it's so unfortunate at the uh, University Open House, I was working, you know, sort of looking at the, the printer and it was clear that I was associated with the exhibit and a student in an environmental program walked by and she gave me a look of disgust. And she said, wow, over here, all we're trying to do is save the world and you're <laughs> using machines to make food. And I thought that's so interesting. <laughs> but that, you know, that is another perspective. And you, I think, have to acknowledge that, <clears throat> pardon me, it won't be for everyone and maybe to have people appreciate, you know, it's not that complicated, it's not that different, might not be a, a leap that they can take. Okay, we do actually have to stop here because. <laughs> I need to stay on time here because we're only scheduled to, yeah. till 11 o'clock online. So we're going to take a short break here, um, less than 10 minutes, people. So coffee, bathrooms, and to everybody online, we will be back um, in about uh, seven minutes. <laughs> All right, and we are back once again. So our next speaker is Ellie. And so Ellie, if you want to put on your webcam, we are ready for you to start. And you have yourself muted still, so. Hello. Um, Perfect. Trying to see if there's a way to blur my background because I just have random notes and stuff behind me, but I'm not seeing a way, so. Okay. If you want to know what I'm up to, there's all the projects that I'm working on right now and other funny drawings. Um, hello, everyone. I can't see anyone, but I assume people can see and hear me. You bet we can see and hear you. Everything's good. Perfect. Perfect. So I'm so excited to uh, chat with everyone today. Um, just listening to the other presentations, it's really cool to see so many people kind of in this same very small industry, but all coming to very similar conclusions and um, working on, on all the same things. So I am um, the founder and CEO of Coco Press. Um, I, uh, we make 3D chocolate printers and I'm just here to, I don't want to repeat too much of what you've heard from other people, but there will be some repeats. So I'll focus a little more on my background and just talking about 3D food printing from the manufacturer side. Um, but the first question I always get is, how did you get into 3D food printing? Um, I've been working on it for about nine years now, uh, so starting in the fall of 2014. And I basically came to 3D food printing just through my love of engineering, and that came from my love of art. So I was really interested in glass blowing, woodworking, weaving, ceramics, and stuff like that. And that then let me kind of combine all of these different things into single projects. And I promise this does relate. Um, I find making in general and just innovation in general, combining a whole bunch of different things that have come before into one project. So with this, I was interested in woodworking. So I built a loom and then I painted it and then used that loom to make belts and guitar straps and stuff like that. And that kind of set me up once I went into engineering to do the same things, combine multiple things that I'm passionate about, food and technology. I first saw 3D printers, um, or I first started using 3D printers in 2013, which is crazy that that just passed 10 years. Um, I was in, engineering class in high school and I wanted to build this a uh, quadcopter and so I was building a drone and that's kind of how my obsession with 3D printing started. My senior year of high school um, I was in an intro to engineering class and was kind of naive enough to think that I could build anything. Um, I had seen you know a pancake printer and was like I want one of those but you know, I couldn't buy one, but my school was willing to fund uh, engineering projects. So that was really lucky and, and very fortunate to go to a school in 2013, 2014 that had 3D printers, um, you know, plastic printers. 
So this was the first project I did. It was supposed to be a six month project. It turned into a full year and I made this, you know, plywood box. And my first print was a Hershey kiss that of course I was in high school at the time. Everyone thought it was the poop emoji. And I do see what they mean. Um, but that I was so proud of this. The fact that I had actually created a 3D printer to do something that at the time wasn't super easy to find a commercially available food printer. So this was the most impressive thing that I made at the time. It was a, um, I don't know, like 13 layer tall vase. Um, but I was obsessed with it. So I went to college, I studied mechanical engineering and um, went to the University of Pennsylvania and just kind of kept working on the printer because it was always in the back of my head, like this is good, but this could be better. And so I did revision after revision. I started showing it off at maker fairs, um, hardware meetups. Again, I'm mostly coming from the technology side and I've learned the food side since. Um, but that's really interesting because I knew nothing about chocolate when I started. I didn't know very much about food. You know, I worked in a, re uh, in a diner for a minute, but that's, that's very different, I think, than the actual food science. Um, so Cocoa Press became my senior design capstone project, my senior year in college, and also my engineering entrepreneurship project. So by my last semester in college, I was working on Cocoa Press for two out of my four classes, getting college credit for it, having some funding from them, and just kept making revisions to this printer. Um, and you can see in the quality of the parts, you know, I'm going from that's kind of a vase to that's a little bit of a melty vase to, okay, I'm actually starting to see what's supposed to be, you know, from the computer file. It, it can do it, it can replicate it. Um, way more revisions of chocolate printers. I've made a lot of chocolate printers. Um, so I started working on Cocoa Press full time right after college. Um, that was almost five years ago. So I graduated in 2019 and I've been doing it ever since. Kind of going back and forth between selling chocolate and attempting to sell hardware. Um, the printer in the middle there was the the big box that was the first printer that i commercially sold um didn't do so well for technical reasons and also um um sorry just reading the comment that came through um for technical reasons and also uh marketing and whatever but it really showed me hey who actually wants a food printer what what kind of role does this have in the market and led me to where I am now, which is this machine. And we're selling them and we have kits available and have sold, I think we've shipped about 130 of these units um, since we launched them in September. So it's a really exciting time right now. And uh, just trying to figure out, you know, where do we go from here? Um, these printers, we're selling them just as DIY kits. And so it's a little bit more towards the engineering community and the maker community. And our goal is kind of build its way back up so that, um, you know, kitchens can use it and other businesses that are already used to making um, chocolate prints, or sorry, already used to making chocolate and making customized things uh, can use it. But right now we're focused a little more on the hobbyist industry, although there are some small businesses, small businesses using it as well. Um, it's come a long way. It's come a really long way. That picture on the right is my favorite print I've ever done. It is an articulating fish. And so that means that it has um, hinges that were printed in place with it. Um, it didn't use any supports. I know there was a question about that earlier. Um, you can definitely use supports in chocolate printing. Um, I use something called organic supports and just use a hot knife and cut it right away. And that's my snack for doing the print. Um, so yeah, it has really come a long way, but I got ahead of myself here. 
why should we 3D print food and why do we 3D print other materials? Again, I know I might repeat some things that other people say, but I'm hoping I have a slightly different perspective on it and that it's still interesting and yeah. Um, and I'm really excited for the questions at the end because um, I really enjoyed listening to other people's questions earlier. So start thinking of them and I'm happy to talk about whatever because I think I'm in a slightly unique role here being an equipment manufacturer and not being from the food industry, but obviously interacting a lot with the food industry. Let's start with why do we 3D print plastic? I would say it all comes down to customization because with 3D printing, there's no mold costs. And so for the most part, complexity is free. Um, printing is great for rapid prototyping, but it can also be used to actually create the final production parts. Uh, one example I would give is Adidas and Carbon who are, have teamed up to 3D print the insoles of shoes. And this is great because previously Adidas has to run a batch of, I believe it's 10,000 shoes before it made economic sense. And you know, with four to six weeks to make a mold, dozens of sizes, if you take into account half sizes, and they have to stock all of those. So it's kind of no wonder that they're looking at 3D printing. I have the Adidas shoes, I'm wearing them now, and they are really comfy. They're my everyday shoes. And it's really cool that they have a 3D printed insole. Um, I also wear um, custom orthotics because I have flat feet. And to get those, when I was a kid, I had to go to a specialist, have my uh, foot in like a plaster mold. And this time I just walked back and forth on what was basically a treadmill for like two or three minutes. And it took a 3D scan and I had custom printed insoles that work better than any off the shelf one I've ever had. So I'm excited for the future of kind of 3D printing these final production parts. Um, printing is an incredible hobby because it's relatively small investment at this point to be able to print things in plastic. And the stuff that you can make is really impressive. Stuff for your house, stuff for fun, toys for kids. And 3D printing can also be a good educational tool. It's a wonderful introduction into engineering, and it really allows teachers in different fields to take complicated topics and make it into like a physical object for their students to touch. It creates kind of this new tactile dimension. Uh, and then of course, as an introduction into engineering, I think it's really rewarding. And I've seen from some middle school classes that I've been involved in through mentoring robotics teams and things that students love being able to do something on the computer and then a few hours later or maybe the next day come back and actually hold it in their hand um and i think that that's actually really powerful as a way to get kids into interested in stem and all of those come down to customization with no molds with no injection molds so printing food has all of the same advantages it comes down to customization and the three way, you know, I think I'm setting this up a little bit differently than some of the previous presenters did, but I see the main three reasons as 3D food printing for personalization, for the environment, and for health. Again, all customization. So I'll go through each of these quickly. Um, I mainly focus on personalization. So I'm definitely biased in that, in that way. 3D printing for health. Uh, I know we just heard about uh, the broccoli example, um, which was really cool. But I would say 3D printing is still really in the early stages for being used to improve people's health. Um, one example is, you know, helping people with dysphagia who have difficulty in swallowing food. And if they have to eat pureed food for extended periods of time, that is unappetizing often. Um, pureed food has, you know, an unattractive appearance and less variety has diluted tastes often. So 3D food printing really allows the pureed food to look like the ingredient, look like the original ingredients while being safer to eat than, you know, if they were eating non-pureed food or non-printed food. And that leads to a better sensory experience and more enjoyment of meals. And honestly, for something you do three times a day, it's, it's important to enjoy all the meals you eat. And there have been studies that show that 
it increases the amount people are eating and, um, you know, the overall outcome and, and health. In the military, um, the army has done, uh, armies around the world actually, have done years of research into 3D printing for customizing nutrients and food. So if you combine this with say wearable sensors, um, meals can be custom made to include the necessary vitamins, minerals, stimulants, or whatever the person needs that day. So it's food printing is the ultimate form of individualized manufacturing. And that's increasingly being used to improve uh, people's health around the world. I would say one of the things about food printing I'm most excited about is for the environment. So the consumption of meat has a huge effect on climate change. According to Redefine Meat, more fresh water is being used to raise cattle than is used by all humans combined, and more pollution is emitted to produce beef than by all cars on the road. And this has created this race for fake or alternative meat products like the one in this photo. Um, companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods have been making huge strides towards meat substitutes, but there's a reason that both of those companies mainly create hamburgers because mimicking something like a steak is much more challenging because of the internal structure. So Redefine Meat is using 3D printing, sorry, Redefine Meat is 3D printing meat using fat, blood, and muscle to mimic the marbling and, and taste found in various cuts of steak, all without using any animal products. I think once we can make, uh, you know, either lab grown or, or fake meat taste good, people will just start choosing it as an alternative, not because of any reason, but it has the ability to potentially be less expensive in the future because you don't need all the land and farms and it'll taste good. Um, these are the products that Redefine Meat is currently offering. I think there were a few more that were cut out of the screenshot. And it was cool because I first looked at them about three years ago and the number of things that they are offering is exploding and just starting to get a little more and more complicated. It's still not quite at, you know, I'm going to go to my favorite steak restaurant and get their uh, signature print of steak, but we'll get there. Um, as I said, my absolute favorite case of 3D food printing is for personalization. And I know it's 1 p.m. or 1 p.m. my time, 11 a.m. your time, I believe. So I will go through this so we have time for questions. Um, but 3D food printing for personalization, I think, is incredibly powerful. In the U.S. and really in other countries as well, we're in a transition period from mass manufacturing to mass personalization. So we've seen this with Coke placing people's names on bottles or uh, Hershey customizing the packaging uh, for their chocolates. Companies are really looking for ways to engage their audiences. And 3D printing lowers those barriers of entry to customizing food because you don't have to be a chocolatier to make the delicious cake toppers as seen in the first photo here, um, which actually my girlfriend made the cake and I printed the cake topper uh a few years ago that was a really fun project um again i have no training in chocolate so to be able to make these really cool chocolates um i made the top left middle bottom and bottom right um images here is really cool and i just want to stress that i don't see 3d printing as replacing traditional artistry i'd say it's it's another tool in the arsenal of ways companies can differentiate themselves so I think both food printing and traditional artistry will continue to expand, much like um, the art of painting has continued to grow alongside photography. I get a lot of pushback, or in the past, I've gotten a lot of pushback on you know, automating people's jobs or something like that. And that is absolutely not what I think this is. I think it is just another tool to allow for unique stuff. Um, so personalization can refer to making people's names or printing a scan of their face, but it can also refer to textures and flavors. So in the bottom right corner, I have these texture samples, and a lot of that is not possible to make with traditional chocolate making. So it's not only being able to make things more easily or inexpensively that are custom, but it's really 
allowing you to do things that you can't do without using food 3D printing. At the moment, it's mainly textures, um, but I see in the future it expanding to, you know, mix, uh, not quite mixing flavors, but having different flavors all in the same, uh, same, I call it a part because again, I come from the engineering side, but all from the same dessert um, and mixing those flavors in unique ways that would be extremely difficult or time intensive or not worth it with traditional um, manufacturing. So food printing can be in high-end restaurant. Uh, restaurant Mink in the Netherlands uses a ton of bifo food printers, or it can be in your own kitchen. Uh, like the bottom left is the pancake pot. And that is, you know, two or three hundred dollars unless you make pancakes in any shape. Um, I actually love that it does different colors just by adjusting the cooking time. Uh, very, very cool product. And then we already heard about the um uh, things that can kind of dissolve in your drinks uh, for for mixers and stuff, like in the top right. Um, let's see, what else do I have for you here? Um, in the future, I think that food printing will continue to expand and just grow in all of these different ways. So in customization, in unique textures, and getting kind of more into unique ingredients. Um, and so just kind of at the end here, just these are a whole bunch of various projects I've worked on. Um, I think customization, I think food printing overall is going to allow for this big shift in the way that we interact with our food. You know, we can live healthier lives. Those with swallowing disorders can eat better and bespoke meals can be made with varying levels of nutrients. I think printing, 3D food printing will be vital to enable the creation of realistic tasting meat and help avoid the further pollution of the environment. Um, I think it's going to allow for personalization that's not currently possible with food. And what I am really excited about is just that even for people who don't have any knowledge of the culinary arts, we'll be able to start experimenting with unique textures and flavors and shapes. So that's that's kind of what I have for you. And I'm really excited to hear any questions you have just about food printing, my experiences, or life. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ellie. We'll now open it up to questions either online or in the room. So the first one we'll start online is like, can you select your desired nutritional requirements or facts under personalization? Can you select your desired nutritional things under personalization? Uh, yes. I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but um, I haven't worked on that side specifically, but I know someone who was working on basically using uh, stool samples to s figure out, you know, what what you were deficient in. And effectively, you would then have, you know, some sort of multi-head machine that could um yeah create something that will will help you more than just choosing between a couple off the shelf uh protein bars types of things so i'm not sure if that fully answers the question but i think it's interesting and unique and i'm excited to kind of see where that goes in the future all right if they need more clarification they can follow up with me oh actually Example, a desired amount of salt or sugar. Yeah, I think that kind of all falls under exactly what you might see in terms of um, nutrients and stuff like that. You know, it's, I, I think this is one that I've struggled with a little bit more because I don't fully see the benefits over, um, offering just a wide array of, you know, low sodium, uh, higher sodium, lower sugar, higher sugar types of, you know, protein bars or something that's made in a more traditional way. But I could see for specific use cases, especially if there are other um, um, health concerns, you know, being able to really monitor that and having someone 
uh, being able to change it kind of on the fly at home would be could be uh, an interesting use case for that. Um, but I'm not in the healthcare uh, field, so that's partially a guess based on people I've talked to. All right, I'll open questions up to the room. Do, is there any questions? Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> hello. Loud and clear. I'm curious if your printer comes with like a slicing profile. Like how how do you accommodate different recipes through your slicer? Um, what whatever the design. Yeah. So um, right now, um, ours is only doing chocolate. Um, we currently have, you know, a milk dark and white chocolate that we offer. And I also know that people are playing with their own chocolates. Um, in terms of the slicer, we are built into Prusa Slicer, which is one of the more popular slicers for plastic printing. So we're actually a preset. If anyone, you know, out there has Prusa Slicer installed in their computer and is on, you know, some version from the last three months or so, um, you can actually just go add a printer and add the cocoa press. And that is really cool for me to see that because I've been using that software for a long time. And so to be a, a, a preset is is really cool. Um, and yeah, so we come with all of, um, we come with slicer profiles for everyone and, and you know, easily modifiable type of thing. Thank you. Next question in the room. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ellie, for the presentation. It was awesome to hear your path of what you did so far with the printer. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one would be, have you had a chance to add a heating element to your printer to, to turn it into some sort of like a baking uh, platform where you can cook simultaneously or after you print? That's the first question. The second one, how far out are you from the scenario where uh, you could print, I don't know, a Mars bar in the kitchen uh, what are the challenges, the biggest challenges you're having for that? Yeah. Um, so for the first one, in terms of heating elements, right now our system uses, I don't think I have one within arm's reach, but our system uses kind of a two heater um, thing inside of the extruder. So we can heat the nozzle separately from the body. Um, it's far more limited to be, you know, 40 degrees or something for chocolate specifically. But it's funny you asked that today because later today I'm planning to see if we can get up to, you know, 80 or 150 Celsius to play with some new unique uh, materials. As for cooking it after, if we were using, I don't know, a, a cookie dough or something you wanted to cook afterwards, um, I haven't done that. In the previous machine that we had, um, that middle one, it had this... Um, insulated build chamber uh so you could theoretically retrofit something like that with an oven but it's not something that i've played with because i'm very focused on chocolate it's it's uh, a fun material and very difficult and i'm i'm excited to expand past that um in terms of creating you know a mars bar in the kitchen i don't think that we are going to move away from traditional molding it's just so much faster it's always going to be so much faster you know we're not moving away from injection molding of mechanical parts um except when you want to do small runs and other stuff so i i wouldn't say that you would print something like a mars bar i think that if you wanted a customized version uh something that i did was mold uh weird picture in the middle there but molding those bars, and then I printed the text on top. So I think, you know, it'd be more of how can we combine traditional manufacturing and additive manufacturing over um, replacing it and, and creating it, the whole thing in your kitchen. That's my thoughts. Thank you. Any other questions from the room here? Um, what would be like the retail cost for one of your printers? Ours are uh, $1,499, uh, $1,499 US, um, and we're currently only shipping them to the US and Canada, um, and that's for a kit. So they come, it's like a 10 to 15 hour assembly and printing your own parts so that we also sell parts. Um, we'll have like a fully assembled Pro One. Uh, this isn't announced yet, but in April-ish, and that'll be closer to 4,000 US. 
Um, and that might include some stainless steel panels. So a little bit more, but I'm pretty proud of that price point, to be honest, just to be able to get, you know, get more people playing with food printing is kind of the goal there. Um, and it's a really, really good assembly. Um, so even if people don't have experience with printers, they're able to follow the assembly manual so far. Anyone else? All right, there seems to be no more questions. So I would like to invite Michelle back up to the front. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Ellen. Well, thank you to our presenters. We've heard a lot of really good, in interesting information for many of us, myself included, a lot of learning happening here this morning. So thank you for that. And I know we're, we're tight for time. Um, we're a little bit over, so I want to jump to it. Before I do, we did print out Daniela's QR code for her survey. You'll find them around the room. You'll find them in the lab when we go in there for the workshop. So if you have a chance, please take a picture of that. This concludes our presentation portion of the session. I would like to, again, thank the U of A for inviting us to participate in co-hosting this event today and for being our expert speakers on this subject. Greatly appreciated. One more round of applause for the leader. And I would like to thank Ellie for joining us today from, from Philadelphia and bringing to us her live experience with, I mean, goodness, high school, starting to create her own 3D printer and taking it to a business today. So thank you very much, Ellie, for sharing your story and answering our questions. I do want to thank Dolores. Thank you for, for keeping us on track and navigating our way through the hiccups that have come with us today. So thank you for that. Um, now, the next part of our program is actually to go into the laboratory and see some of these food 3D printers in action. Before you continue yeah. on, I'm just going to say thank you to everybody who attended online. And um, you will receive a, um, a recording later today with our, our printed materials. So I'd like to just say thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So when we are going into the lab, and then we also will have a group taking us through the pilot plant for a tour, for a 3D tour, we are going to get you to suit up first as